Of all the places nearest to the school, Kylie picks this one and waiting for the food to be served is as awkward as I've imagined it would be. Not the bad sort though, the pleasant kind. Surprisingly, Luke's an okay bloke when he tries. When so long as you're willing to look past the tactless remarks or we're not exchanging acerbic quips. It's clear he's making an effort for this to be as fun as possible for the six-year-old by being chattier. Even going as far as to laugh when Kylie's story calls for it. It's an interesting thing to hear from the more than once, I catch his frequent cheesed off expression easing whenever he looks at the girl. And your friend? Did you make up with her? Yep! She said she just saw something she didn't like. She didn't accept the jellies, though. She told me to give it to you instead. She knows you like the red ones, too. Very well. Hand it to me later. I'll bring some of them home. I think your Tia would love to have some. What a terrible liar. He says he just likes the idea of having children of his own. But it's easy to see some part of him genuinely wants them. What's stopping him? Once Kylie wanders to the nearby bookshelves after having lost interest in conversation, however, we both revert back to silence. On our own, we have little to talk about, aside from a few questions about the other here and there. At one point, it does veer on local politics and history. He's surprisingly versed with it, he can hold a decent conversation without throwing a jive. Nothing too personal is ever mentioned so far. It's too early for those, and besides, I don't like him enough to speak of every minute detail of my life. Better keep it strictly between the silence and the casual repartee. This whole thing already looks and feels wrong on so many levels. I'm quite sure he feels the same. So when another bout of silence hits us and becomes too much, I've taken to finding something else to occupy myself. Time with my mobile, turning it from hand to hand while we wait for our respective meals. But it'll be a complete lie if I say I'm not waiting for some intervention. Something to pull me away from this place. Someone. Ash is probably at Salem Ball by this time working on whatever business he has there. Maybe if I make up an excuse and leave now, I can still catch him? Cut that out. It's distracting. My hand stills, holding the gadget awkwardly between us, arrested mid-pass by his bored tone. He's been quiet for a long time now, after complaining about how appalling the tea they're serving here. Before that, he has whined about how uncomfortable his chair is and the tasteless decorations they have here. Previous to that, he has griped about how dull the place is compared to the one he frequents on the upper class of the city. Well, I'm sorry for being a bunch of peasants, your majesty. Figures he'll lose patience soon having already grumbled about almost everything his eyes can reach. It's just unfortunate he's turned to me now. Why don't you just look somewhere else? I can't. If I turn elsewhere, I might end up looking at the Bob Fock right behind us. <gasps> Bob Fock? Do I even want to ask? I don't want to hear it. If it's coming out of his mouth, it can only be either rude or offensive. Regardless, he continues. Everything looks good, but have you seen the face? 
true horror. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You know, I frown about this in practice, but that mouth needs to be washed out with a particularly potent soap. Preferably by your own mum. A shame she isn't here, hmm? For whatever reason, that puts an end to that talk right away. Because his mom did, Rebecca. But she doesn't know that. He returns to watching his godchild, who has found a particular interesting picture book and is now poring over it while I turn my back to my mobile. Still no message, and you're probably not going to get one. Would it kill him to at least send a message? Check if I were home? Meanwhile, Luke's silence lasts all but ten seconds. What is it with the damn mobile? Are you on a curfew? He's got the immature ex down, Pat. I'll give him that. Seriously, how old is this guy? Has he somehow been deprived of affection during childhood? And what is it to you? I don't think it's any of your business what I do with it. It is my business, all right? One, I'm the one paying here. Two, I'm being forced to eat dinner in a place this stuffed and noisy. Lastly, it's been ten minutes, the food isn't here, and I'm hungry. What you're doing with the mobile is annoying and distracting, when the least you can do is keep things entertaining while I suffer. What? Why do I have to entertain you? That's your problem? Shouldn't you be more worried about how this entire affair looks to other people? Oh, I didn't realize this was one. You move fast, Daisy. You could have informed me first, you know. <laughs> Had I known, I would have taken you someplace nicer. Certainly the kind with better food and plenty of good wine. Uh, why did I ever think this was a good idea? Did it ever occur to you how inappropriate this might look to everyone? <laughs> why should I care? It's only inappropriate if you make it out to be. Relax, I won't do anything to make your boyfriend angry. He doesn't even need to know we dined out. It'll be our dirty little secret. Ew, I don't want any dirty secrets with you, Luke. <laughs> He's not my boyfriend. The words come out of The words come out with more force than I've intended. By the time I realize my slip-up, his lips are already spread in a smear. Heat slowly crawls up in my face. Oh, so there is someone. You're so easy to read. Briefly, his eyes search my face. I have no idea what he sees, nor do I care to know. But in the next second, he barks out a laugh, displaying his amusement without reserve to everyone within earshot. In that moment, I know I flipped a switch in him somewhere, and I lost my chance to deny his assumptions. Do I even want to? Isn't that the reason why I've been so focused on my mobile? Waiting for another message from him? For a reason to dump this awkward meeting to go after him? <laughs> Look how mottled you are! Now the nickname makes more sense. Shy Miss Pink and her cute little crush. The color suits you, by the way. It matches the hair. It's not a crush! Classic denial. But in reality, you want him to be yours. And your every move is made to make him notice you. In fact... You don't want him to see you with another man in a non-professional capacity. Because he might misinterpret it. The same thing goes for you, doesn't it? Bloody, yours is even worse. What about your wife? 
Aren't you concerned she might misinterpret this? Daisy, just because we tied the knot doesn't mean we have to be joined at the hip at every single opportunity. Don't be ridiculous! Why else would you marry her if you don't want to be with her for the rest of your lives? Because, Daisy, she also has other things she can do with her life and friends to spend time with. Granted, I don't like some of them, and I have a few of my own she utterly dislikes. But Wifey doesn't have to know my every move. Nor do I hers. Do you know how boring that would be? To be with the same person for all hours of the day? Losing sleep over the mere fact they're not with you? Or putting everything you have aside to please them? To have your whole world revolve around one person? you just mistaking that for something else? Unlike you, there are other people here who don't share the same jaded outlook you have. Don't lump everyone together just because it didn't work out for you. <laughs> and you, my dear, are unexpectedly naive. about it. If you love each other, wouldn't you want to always see them, be with them, to have them focus solely on you? Maybe you haven't been loved enough. Oh, it's that kind of thing for you, isn't it? The love is eternal, love is a strong emotion shite. A starry-eyed girl pining for her dashing Prince Charming. What's next? Romantic confessions of love? A grand wedding on the beach? Dozens of spawns running around in some picturesque home in the suburbs? How quaint. Are you also expecting it's going to be sunshine and rainbows after? A happily ever after? Please. What? I never once said... Uh, and is all of that such a bad thing to hope for? <laughs> Woman, I've been married for seven years, and I'm telling you, it's far from what you have in your pretty red head. Tell me, how long has this song and dance been going for you and your man? Maybe I am mistaken. Averting my eyes from him is all I manage to do. What does his mere seven years have compared to the seventeen I've had with Ash? It's laughable he thinks those two things are comparable. Uh, lady, you haven't actually had seventeen. Ash. You've had 17 years of pining for Ash, but you've never actually had him, so... Ash and I... 
Ash and I may have never moved past the boundaries of friendship, like what I'm hoping for. But what we have isn't something anyone can scoff at. I've always been by his side, endured everything with him, and I know him better than anyone. No matter what this man, this complete stranger says, I know there will always be a place for me beside him. And yet, and yet... Come on, Daisy, that shouldn't be too hard. Three, five... Eight, ten, twenty. His words easily seep into my heart like sharp daggers, gradually picking apart everything I've ever been sure of. Despite myself, doubts resurface and my defenses crumble right in front of my eyes. No wonder he sees through me, and as expected, he ridicules. <laughs>, laughs restrained low and rumbling a sharp sound striking the air around us amidst the murmur of people and the soft noises of the music playing over our heads his shoulders shake and when his mirth becomes too much even for him he reaches up a hand and passes it over his face as if to hold his glee close to himself bloody bullocks this is just brilliant <laughs> Oh, mother, why do I always keep running into these things? This day couldn't get any better. I think I'm going to need a stiff drink after this. <laughs> he dissolves into another laugh, peal of laughter. But when it subsides, what he has for me are more words. Scathing each of them. The urge to run from here has never been this strong. Is everything you said how you plan to act, if that man of yours ever ends up with you? Cling to him? Put him on a bloody pedestal? Let him become the center of your universe? <laughs> Although with how long this seems to be going on, I think you've already done so. Marriage will just be icing on the top. Like some sort of reward for you, isn't it? For being a good, patient, loyal little girl all this time. Never looking at another man. He must have been having a grand time with someone pining over him this long. I'm a little envious, to be honest. Maybe also a little surprised he hasn't suffocated from all your attention yet. Laugh all about it if you want. It's not like you'll ever understand. Luke falls silent. The ridicule in him is gone in an instant, and his eyes meet mine, sharp and imposing. A challenge, but I hold it against him with the same intensity, because if there's something I won't let his opinion trample on, it's this. What does he know? However, he's the first one who looks away, focusing his eyes back to where Kylie is. And for a moment, I believe I've won. Until he draws in a breath and turns back to me. The words he drops next, though hushed, hang heavily in the distance between us. You're right. I won't. But I do know not to mistake love for obsession, woman. They are not the same thing. It rattles. Out of everything he said tonight, this is the one thing that twin twinges my heart. Maybe it's in the manner he delivers it, the lack of conceit in his posture, or an underlying insult in the tone he takes. The remark is not meant to cut, merely to an express a simple truth. This time, it's him who holds the gaze against mine. Another unspoken challenge, and I realize if this happened minutes before, I'd already have an equally searing retort at the tip of my tongue. There's none. But the anger is there, winging at my insides, prodding at uncertainties I've long kept. Isn't it enough? We have the long years we've been together, 
We had the memories whenever he needs me until other people came in between us. I've always been the one there. That dedication and loyalty should mean something, shouldn't it? I've always been sure of it, and that one day he'll see it for what it is. Even if his heart is still set on someone else. In spite of that, in this minute, under this, this man's scrutiny, my own heart wavers. Now I struggle to find the words. I don't need to answer that. However, there are for me. There are for me to ponder on. This arse, this arse doesn't need to hear them, and neither is his is he entitled to them just because he dished out some profound sounding like wisdom no one asked for. So I look away, hoping my own silence would be enough of an answer for him. And it is for a moment, up until warm, furious tears prickle behind my eyes, singing, begging for release, along with every other frustration this dumb talk has built up in me. All because of this man. I hate him. I hate the fact that he has to be the one to see me in this sorry state. I'm already expecting another bar from him when his expression shifts. Except he panics. In the span of three seconds, his expression changes from indifferent to concern to utter panic. It would have probably been funny if I weren't so irked by the sight of his, of this galactic bastard. Uh, hey, are, are you crying? Are you going to cry? Just stop that right now, woman, or I'll... Will you shut up? He clams up almost before I can finish. Whether this is due to the sudden force in my voice, or how I look, I pretend not to think about it. He seems like a deer caught in headlights. With the way he's making himself smaller in his seat. But I'm still pissed. I'm tired, and if I can't punch him, I can at least scream at him. You're an annoying bag of dick, you know that? If I hear another word from you, I'm sewing that bloody mouth shut myself! It does do the trick. Not to the effect I've hoped for, but the moment I've snapped at him, the stinging at the back of my eyes melts away and a strange calm overcomes me. A fragile thing when found in the middle of a busy coffee shop. Nevertheless, it's appreciated considering it doesn't last immediately broken by the very person that put me in this state with a few awkward pats to my shoulder. Done twice, thrice, and another, until my patience runs out and pulling out the book from my back, raising it threateningly over his head. It'll surely dent his skull if I slam it down at this height. Part of me wants to see that, but I restrain myself. He has the good sense to recoil, though. Shortly, he shrinks back into his seat and waves his hand in front of him in a gesture of surrender. Watch that book, woman! I already warned you about your little threats. You, you don't want to see my brand of angry! Then keep your hands to yourself! All right, that's it. People these days, I swear you treat them nicely and this is where it gets me. You're the last person I'd ever want to comfort me, even if we're the only two remaining people on Earth. Damn. That's cold. Don't flatter yourself. Okay, have it your way, Daisy. And stop calling me Daisy! I have a name, you know! He mutters something inaudible under his breath, after, although, afterwards, he doesn't say anything further. For the next minute, he simply contents himself with making a mess out of paper napkins. 
folding them into clean shapes without any clear intent before crumpling them in his hand when he loses interest and dumping them in the small pile in front of him. A waiter served our meals soon enough, and Kylie, and Kylie makes her way back to our table. Before I can take a single bite, he mutters something. The words spoken in the same tone he's used since, since this morning, all under his breath whenever the honest part of himself would show. Despite my rather confusing opinion of the man, I stop short of shoving food into my mouth to look at him. His eyes are on his food as he speaks, busying himself with the cutting a portion of meat on his plate. But what comes out of him only rings true against my ears above the din of the coffee house. For what it's worth, Rebecca, I didn't ever think that's all there is to you. Why else would I leave my own goddaughter in your care if you're just some lovesick woman? He spears a piece of food, pops it into his mouth, and that's it. One whole day with this man, and I still can't figure out what his deal is. But for what it's worth as well, I don't think he's an entirely bad guy. The rest of our meal slips in silence afterwards. Aside from Kylie's occasional chatter, the whole dinner goes by without another word exchanged between the two of us. Somehow we managed to make it through the whole thing without triggering another tension-riddled conversation. A good thing, perhaps. One, because Kylie's sitting in front of us. And two, I probably won't be able to hold a proper conversation with my mind heavy with thoughts. We 
depart from the coffee house just as the evening crowd starts to thin out. The same wordless silence fills our short walk back to the school. Except for when Luke gestures in the nearby flower shop and enters it without waiting for Kylie and I. He emerges minutes after, carrying a bouquet of daffodils with the same softened expression back on his face. Unlike the previous ones, he tucks this one away almost as soon as he looks up at us, a moment he's not willing to share. In my confusion, he merely answers with a shrug and continues walking. For someone important. I accept it for what it is, if only because he doesn't owe me an explanation. It does leave more questions about him, each one as baffling as the previous one. There are the last words spoken this evening before we head our own ways. Up until I arrive home, I still can't understand him. Here, however, a whole different set of questions awaits me. And much like everything today, it comes with the littlest of things. A lone note greets me upon reaching my unit's door. Its edges flutter lightly against the faint, warm breeze passing through the small complex. My hand stops short of twisting the knob as I stare at it, though I don't make any moves to take it. Dropped by earlier, you weren't around. They're easing Belle out of sedatives tomorrow, trying to see if they can take her out of coma. Good news, huh? Her aunt also wants to talk to us. So if you could come to the hospital, that'd be great. Anyway, how are you doing? Call me when you see when you get this. See ya, Ash. Ashton's neat script lines its surface. The message. The message he left short and straight to the point, and not without the underlying hint of friendship. He mentions nothing of the accident or the ongoing investigation, except for a small request from Isabella's aunt to visit us the next day. Apparently, they're taking her out of medically induced coma to see if she's improved. Suddenly, it's the closest thing we have to hope right now. I can almost hear it in the manner Ashton ends the formal tone in his note when he checks on my well-being at the end. He still has no idea. Any other day, the former part of his message will likely prod at the piercing envy I've been holding, while the latter will probably send my heart a flutter. Little things from him that I want to mean something more. Yet this time, only guilt fills me and my eyes briefly shift towards Isabella's empty unit. Luke's words repeat inside my head as I do. For what it's worth, Rebecca, I didn't ever think that's all there is to you. Why else would I leave my own goddaughter in your care if you're just some lovesick woman? Have I always been like this? This selfish? In truth, I've intended to call Ash after that dinner. If I didn't catch him here, invite him to the party like I planned, this time, and he's pro still probably awake at this hour, my hands won't move. And perhaps it is for the better. Until I've had the time to think this through, it'll be best if I distance myself from those I've been clinging tightly to. Find a different perspective and see things for what they are. With a soft sigh, I reach for the note and crumple it 
under my hand. The knob twists open with much ease when I enter this time. Maybe after some introspection, it'll be easier. For tomorrow, I have that woman in the mansion to worry about. The night wears on without further incident. Despite the great number of thoughts swimming inside my head. Come morning, there's only a hush, a strain, a sort of stillness, unlike the ones greeting me every morning. This one's uneasy, tight with anticipation, like a string stretched thin, merely waiting for the proper time to snap. Granted, it doesn't make my day any less pleasant, but the edge is there. It hangs in the hallway. It lingers in the empty unit next to mine. It follows me even as I head out, carrying the same little hope Ashen's note brought last night. I just wish I could easily believe in it. It takes a minimum of 21 days for a habit to form. Or so claimed a speaker in a conference I once attended. Yet it only took less than three for the hospital's sterile scent to lose its sharp odor. Perhaps less than that for the nurses start glancing at me with an air of familiarity. For my body to know instinctively where I should head to which turn to take, how far it is from the nearest stairwell, approximately how many steps I take before I reach her door. Thirty, to be exact. I've honestly stopped counting some time during my second visit. At some point, even the faint beeping from her room has also grown oddly comforting. A strange thing to seek reassurance from. Times like this, however, it's all that we have. Isabella's lucky. By some miracle, by some sheer force of will, she holds on and pushes back just as death holds. How long will it last, though? Even now, she's still a hair's breadth away from losing that struggle. And no matter how promising today might be, the doubt still runs deep. At least for me, it does. Sometimes, it's better not to hope too much. Although... Both Zachary and Ashton don't seem to be of the same mind. With the smiles, they greet me the moment I arrive. A small part of me expects this meeting to be awkward. With Zachary here, after he saw me in such a pitiful state. But it is him who first offers me a seat. If he remembers or still has an opinion about what happened two days ago, he makes no mention of it again. Likely out of some sense of courtesy. I suppose this is how we'll keep it together for now. With moments filled with super superficial smiles and lukewarm attempts at cordiality. How is she? The question, at least, is anything but half-hearted. As if spurred by it, Ashton looks up the first time he does so since his brief welcome earlier. His eyes have been glued to the room nearest to us, its door only slightly ajar offering everyone outside nothing but a sparse look of what's inside. All I see is uncertainty. Yet, he stares at it with something close to hopeful. Like doing so will summon another miracle from the depths of near impossibility. Bloody, it's all over his face before his voice breaks the silence. Doing okay so far. They've reduced the sedation hours ago, but it'll take a while before we know anything for sure. The Ashton I know will never subscribe to that kind of false hope. If there's anyone present here who would be, it's Zachary. 
For reasons no longer unknown to me, he does it anyway. The nurses are just monitoring her now. He gestures with his head towards the door, just as one of the said nurses moved past inside. Her aunt's not in there, though? Nah, she's speaking with the doctors right now. She'll be back in a few. She didn't say anything before she left? Don't know. I arrived just when she stepped out. You're gonna have to ask Ash about that. He came in here hours before I did. She was talking to him about something. <laughs> Is that a joke? Ashton arrived earlier than you did? <laughs> yeah, America, ain't it? I'm sitting right here, you two. A peal of laughter follows his remark, despite ourselves in this mess of a situation. Immediately, the, move ar the mood around us lifts, if only a little. I doubt it'll shift to normal entirely. Not when there are still, still a great number of things we've intentionally le left unspoken. Amazing how simple this is, though pretending everything's the way they used to be, with only a few words. <laughs> we ain't the only ones, though. Bella would probably have had plenty to say about it, you know? She wakes up at four, Zach. Every day. That's inhuman on so many levels. Besides, none of you can even get out of bed at six, so get off my case. If Isabella's got a problem with my morning habits, she can complain about it when she's out of coma. When, not if. Now, of all times, he chooses to be like this, decides to forgo all hard truths to chase after the one, or that one light at the end of the tunnel. Despite Zachary's reassurance days ago, I'm not foolish enough to carry an expectation as heavy as that. Knowing that she has the chance of taking comfort in the idea is one thing. Clinging on to it and blindly believing what might be improbable is another. You don't sound too worried about this. Didn't the doctor say there'll be no guarantee? This is just to see if she's improved. That still doesn't mean she'll get better. Yeah, well, it's not like there's anything we can do about this. She's already there. We're already here. I'd rather not lose sleep over this if I can help it. I've got other things to worry about. All lies. If he truly believes that, he won't be taking a hand through his hair after that remark. I've seen him do it more times than I can count to know he only does that when he's frustrated. If this truly hasn't already weighed on him, the lines of his shoulders won't have that tired slump, nor in his voice will have that exhausted It has been, it has all been there since this started. It's not going to disappear anytime soon. Because if there's anything all these years has taught me, it's that Ashton hates losing anyone, both in the figurative and literal sense. It happened with his mom. It happened with his dad. And with her like this, on the brink and teetering between life and death, he'll try everything to keep her. You'd think the world would be much more forgiving once people like him start thinking in such a way. But it is a harsh place still, and sometimes as good as a notion it is, there are things that are simply out of our control. When it reminds us of it, it does so brusquely in the form of another voice piercing through the dense silence in the hall. Miss Santos! Miss Santos! Get rapid response here! Call for doctors Nicholas and Beatrix Stat! 
Tension returns to the hallway. For a couple of agonizing minutes, only the sounds behind her room reverberated in the hall. A calm voice urgently calling orders, two sets of feet moving about, the rapid beeping of the machines inside. Suddenly, merely standing in the hall soon proves to be smothering. Too small, too tight, too stifling as the rest of the world fades into nothing. And only the room in front of us matters. Next to Zachary and I, Ashton now stands rigid. The lines of his jaw are clenched firmly while he gapes at the tiny opening in the door with his wide eyes. I haven't even noticed when he has risen from his seat, but a struggle is clear on his face. Though before he can take a single step forward, Zachary's hand lands on his shoulders, holding him back. Despite his own worries, he is nothing but forbearing when he mutters his reassurance. Chill, man! Let them do their work! Leave it to them! She's in good hands, so please, give those guys inside a little credit. They were able to save her the first time, yeah? It's not a code. She hasn't coded yet. Almost as if to confirm it, the loudspeakers crackle to life, broadcast echoing Zachary's words throughout the whole hospital. Rapid response, room 49. Rapid response, room 49. Paging Dr. Nicholas Vogel and Dr. Beatrix Vogel, rapid response. Please head to room 49, stat. The message blasts on for another minute before it finally ceases. It takes less than that for the hospital's emergency team to arrive, but their presence does nothing to ease the disquiet in each of us. Ashton's most of all. The minute a nurse shuts the door firmly on us, he releases the breath he's been holding, along with it every shard of hope he'd allow himself to carry. Now, crushed under the weight of what we've just seen and every expectation he's carried, it's not surprising that when he air around us becomes too heavy to bear for someone like him, he's the one who first steps out. Like every time this has happened. I'm... I'm going to step out for a while. I need some air. Ashton! Without another word, he gently brushes Zachary's hand off his shoulders and leaves. Not to run away, never to run away. He's still too stubborn for that. His pride won't let him when he knows he hasn't exhausted his options. This is so he can force what remains of his wits into some semblance of order from his prying eyes. And though Ashton doesn't say a single thing, Zachary understands this need quite well. It's a place he's been to numerous times, it's one he requested of us for reasons I've yet to know and he's yet to tell. Hence he refrains from voicing these thoughts or stopping the younger man once he removes himself from the hall. There's still, however, an undeniable edge to his voice when he urges me to do the opposite, an underlying anxiety beneath that smiling facade. One, I allow myself to return in spite of the hesitation his next words spur. You should go after him. What? And leave you here? I can wait. And I don't think those guys in there would be coming out anytime soon. You'll just get bored. Besides, he listens to you. Before, perhaps. He still will. Nothing about that has changed. He's a grown man, not a baby. I don't have to console him every time something upsets his manly ego. <laughs> I 
Doubt must have surfaced in my face for all my efforts to mask it. Because the next thing I know, he's laughing. Tired, though lighter than I've heard from him despite these past few days, like a heaviness temporarily lifting. I wondered how much this whole thing has taken a toll on him. Strangely, that fact has never occurred to me until now. But even then, he continues as if nothing's wrong. Now, along with reluctance, swims a twinge of guilt. All this time, I've been looking at how this has only affected both Ashton and I, when Zachary is in much need of comfort. After all, he understands Isabella in ways neither of us, neither the rest of us can. But you know it can be one sometimes. Go on. I'll let you two know if anything changes here. And I get the sense you two still have a lot of, uh, <clears throat> things to, uh, talk about. That much is still true. But I know Ashton. He's not a man who expresses himself freely. He will not yield until he's ready, and this one, this one might not be too willing to share yet. Still, a huge part of me wishes to go to him. <clears throat> Sometimes I resent myself for getting caught between making such calls. Um... Sorry, I lost my pen. Give me a second for tele. In the end, I can't even bring myself to leave. However, it's not a matter of my resolve suddenly dissipating into thin air, but more out of consideration for the other man. Ash needs this space, this time to think for himself, away from me, away from any opinions other people might have on this matter, including Zachary. Otherwise, he wouldn't have left. Although, I'm sure Zachary understands this as well, knowing doesn't stop him from throwing curious glances my way. Especially when a long minute has passed and I haven't moved, despite his urging. You can stop with the looks now, Zachary. Sorry. You just confused me, is all. You're usually the first person to step in and ride him. must be new to him, seeing me not chase after Ash. Even if I want to go after him, we need to give him some room to breathe. Did you see how he looked when he left? That's not the face of someone who wants to do some talking. Positive? Because like I said, 
Yes, stop worrying. Anyway, I don't think he'll appreciate whatever it is I have to say right now. It isn't exactly pleasant news. Don't know. Pretty sure he's already put two and two together. He's a sharp guy. But, uh, I just thought you might still want to sort some stuff out. And not this, uh, I, I mean, the, um, <clears throat> other one. Quickly, this conversation has taken a personal turn. As soon as I can, I avert my eyes from him, turning towards the hands resting on my lap. An urge to press them together in a grip rises. I wonder how much he knows. How much of it has he observed and figured out in the few years we've been friends? He may just be staying his tongue out of some sense of deference. I won't blame him. If he feels that way, we've never grown close as friends. Though it does make the whole situation embarrassing now. Out of everyone, including me, he's the one who's keeping a level head and trying not to let everything fall apart. I'm sure being nosy isn't his intention, he's just worried. But sometimes, that kind of concern comes unwarranted. We should just move from this topic before anything damaging is said for Zachary, Ashton and I can find some other day to clear the air between us. I just don't think this is the right place to do that. Or time. If there will be one later after this is over. Or, if some point in the future will allow such, I can't tell. In the first place, this has been a one-sided affair. I can act furious all I want, but one fact stands. Ashton doesn't have the faintest idea both of what's going on, or whatever feelings I hold for him. He never had, never even noticed. It'll be unfair to place any blame on him, or the other person in this, when I'm as equally responsible by keeping it to myself, wishing he'd notice on his own. Finally! Finally you understand, oh my god. It's taken how long? And now I've lost the chance. What right do I have to act frustrated or draw people like Zachary into this? It shames me that he has to be the one making those little efforts when my own feelings should be my responsibility. I promise we'll talk, okay? Worry about yourself instead. How are you holding up? Although his eyes flicker momentarily in my direction, he gives no indication the sudden change in subject bothers him. But there's a brief pause before he answers, like Ashton when he's being mindful of his words, however rare that happens. As good as I can, you know me. I can always handle myself. Then, in almost an exact contradiction of that statement, he leans away slightly, as if to hide what I may see in his face. Of movement so small, I wouldn't have noticed if I haven't been paying closer attention. Only now I am seeing the dark circles under his eyes. Only now am I noticing the red trimming of the edges. Suddenly, the tired slump in his shoulders carries a different, heavier meaning. A pang of regret immediately hits me, fiercer than the one that did earlier. I've been so focused on other matters, other things, 
one person, but I've completely forgotten those around me. What an awful mistake to make. You don't look too good today, though. Oh, uh, it's, it's just a movie. Jitters, you know? Are you still upset about those reviews? I thought Belle and I already... No, no, it's okay. It still bothers me, but only a little now. Not in the way you're thinking, I... I know what I said last week. I remember it loud and clear. I made a promise. No quitting. I've just been having a few bad dreams lately. It'll, it'll pass soon, Rebecca. The Film Fest is scheduled to last for two weeks before they award the winners, if I remember correctly. Knowing him, how he didn't really hold any expectations when he entered, or even the confidence in his own work, jitters is putting it mildly. Somehow, though, I have the feeling it's not the entire reason why he's in this state. That he's leaving it out on purpose. I won't ask further than he allows me to. But our concerns shouldn't go unspoken, regardless of what he isn't telling us. Don't push yourself too hard, okay? You've been with her since the first day. Give yourself a break if you think you need it. At this rate, you might be the one who'll end up here first, not me. <laughs> I didn't realize there's a competition going on. Why can't any of you ever take my warning seriously? Well, the mood's already dreary. <laughs> no use bogging it down with gloomy and stuff. And, uh... I just don't think she'd want to wake up to this. <laughs> yeah, if Isabella was sitting here, she'd probably do the same thing. <laughs> the soft laughter that follows is an odd thing to hear in the hall's dense air, but we let it ring regardless. It's a relief from the somber mood, if anything, a tiny measure to prevent the weight of this from crushing all of us. And it works. We lapsed into a companionable silence soon after. A rare thing between the two of us, but nevertheless a welcome change. Here too, something has shifted. No further words are exchanged after that, and perhaps it is for the better. The quiet stretches on further until the door finally creaks open. By this time, the seconds and minutes have already blurred together, forming a haze in my mind. None of the doctors tell us, none of the things the doctors tell us registers. Zachary's steady presence is a blessing during moments like this. How he can keep a clear head while listening to whatever bad news they're saying escapes me. Ashton finally shows back up minutes later and understandably he tenses the second he catches sight of the medical team walking away from the room. A multitude of expression flashes across his face. Confusion, apprehension, dread, all in under a minute till it settles back to his usual impassive mask. If given the chance, he'd probably run in there to see for himself, but Zachary raises a stalling hand before he can think of it. The nervous line in his mouth gradually melts into a smile, or one resembling it. Lately, seeing a genuine one on any of us seems almost like a luxury. Nevertheless, Ashton lets it ease him. There's nothing else after all. She's stable now, but they've placed her back in a coma. She'll be under observation for the rest of the day, so no visitors for now. Still not the best news we've heard in a while. I don't think it's what's Ash it's what Ashton's hoping to hear either.
We're back to square one. Back to another waiting game with no clear sight in it. Of course, none of us mentions it, even if the meaning's all too clear in our heads. There's still, however, relief in this. Something we can carry when the three of us leaves the hospital for now. If that alone will be enough remains to be seen. <clears throat> At least tonight, I'll have something to help take my mind off things. Hopefully, where this all started would provide the answers I'm looking for. That'll be one less thing to me worry about, if so. Except the whole thing's off to a bad start. And all of a sudden, whatever Isabella claimed dwelling in this mansion becomes the least of my concern. Of all the cabbies in Luxmorn, I have to chance upon the superstitious one. Still not as bad as finding out your car starting starter refuses to crank on when it was still working this morning, yes? But it's equally as frustrating when you're forced to walk the rest of the way. All because the driver got spooked. Isabella and him will get along so well. After all, I've had my fair taste of the bazaar lately. All of which might have been brought upon by the letter Isabella found here. But you'd think he'd be at least charitable enough to take me a little close to the house itself. Not a distant 15 minutes away by foot. Good thing I'm not wearing anything too formal or constricting. Otherwise, the short walk would have likely put me in a bad mood. Long before I've had to suffer in a room full of strangers tonight. Although this soon proves to be a problem, the second the driveway comes into a view and I near the entrance. Severely underdressed is a total understatement to describe how I look cars worth more than my own apartment and childhood home combined line the mansion's front yard. Men and women decked out in their best also flock near the entrance. Most are eager for the festival's festivities to start while some are simply idling about, enjoying the warm afternoon sun before it sets. But once the woman standing at the front porch speaks, their undivided attention immediately shifts to her. Presumably Miss Wright from the confident manner she holds herself among present company. This, despite keeping a far simpler appearance than the rest of her own guests or not having her husband beside her. A trait worthy of utmost admiration and best. At worst, she's the envy of every woman, the subject of every gospel. Welcome! Welcome, everyone! And Mum said we could have been good friends? I can't even picturing myself mingling with the kind of guests she has. Though I admit she does seem familiar now that I've seen her this close. Memories of sitting in a vanity not mine, being dressed in clothes far too fancy for my taste. They flit briefly in my mind until her cheerful tone rises above the buzz of her enraptured audience again. Please, make yourselves at home! I wish I can share her enthusiasm, really. 
But being surrounded by all this extravagance. For lack of a better term, merely makes me dread how the rest of the night might go. I shouldn't have let Luke's words affect me. I should have just gone ahead and asked Ashton like I planned. If he were here, then I won't have to. Be careful with Shirley, all right? The rest of that thought dies in my mind at once. A moment of astonishment overcomes me for confusion sets in seconds later. It takes another for my body to catch up. Once it does, when I finally turn to see it for myself, it's his familiar mop of hair that catches my eye first. There he is, almost an arm's reach if it isn't for the guest standing between us. Ashton Frey, standing in the Ermengarde Mansion's driveway with an air too lackadaisical for someone who's absolutely abhors any parties of any form. Or has any business here as far as I know. The picture it forms is too bizarre for me that my mouth speaks out ahead of any concern, of oh, any coherent thought. Ashton? He swirls, he swivels on his heels with an equally puzzled expression. An odd expression flashes momentarily across him once he sees me, though he blinks it away before I can figure out what it is exactly. Becca, what are you doing here? I was invited. Really? I had no idea you were friends with the host. Well, it's my parents, actually. But that's beside the point. What are you doing here? You hate parties. I still do. I'm just here on behalf of a friend. That in itself is weird coming from him. It doesn't help that he isn't even making an effort to spare a glance my way when he answers. Instead, they're focused at some point in the crowd. His gaze darting between people walking past us until a small frown forms in that's uh, rare. Do you have someone with you then? Nope, just me. I won't be staying long. Well, if that's the case, maybe you and I can. Chief? Ashton, what's. Unexpectedly, he places a hand on my shoulder, stopping me mid sentence. He still has the distracted look on him, except this time his eyes are sharper, as if he has found what or who he's been searching for among the throng of party doors earlier. Sorry, Becca, I... I need to... there's something I need to check for a bit. I'll talk to you later. Do you have a ride home? No, I had to take a cab here. My car wouldn't start this afternoon. But, but what about... I told you to get that old thing checked before, didn't I? You can head back with me after this. Anyway, I gotta go. See ya. Be careful, okay? I meet the smile he hastily throws my way with a frown of my own. What does he mean by that? But before I can ask already, he has turned his back from me and is walking away without a single explanation whatsoever. In some desperate effort, I try to catch up with him, if only to know what warranted the sudden departure and his odd party at the end. Hey, be careful! About what exact- Only for my attempts to be interrupted by a muffled ringing from my pocket. Mom's cheerful voice greets me as soon as I answer. Yes, yes, I'm at the party already, Mom. Yes, I'll say hi to her if I can. conversation itself doesn't last long. Just a simple hello, a reminder to enjoy the party, and to 
send their regards to their old student. But when the call ends, I get to look up. Ashton's already nowhere in sight. With a sigh and admittedly a little disappointment, I tuck my mobile back into my pocket and head inside. Even with familiar company, however, coincidentally this meeting is, this is somehow shaping up to a terrible evening. The party hits full swing an hour later. With the host's opening remarks given, and still no sign of her husband, the poor woman, and the guests promptly fed, the band shifts the melody to a lively tune. Soon, laughter and rhythmic tapping of shoes fill the room, all in accordance to the lifting strains of music. It seems fun and fascinating at certain moments. The flurry of dancers making the music their own, almost no care. The work so indisposed. I joined the crowd for a song or two. There was a lack of teaching, plenty of them in fact, with some asking more than once. It's only my stubborn refusal that prevents me from joining them, and I can. A single nod is all it can take. The evening would have been far more enjoyable. A pride in my own silly hopes, thought of being seen with one of them, but I can't curb that, which I hate to. Because doing so also means outright acknowledging his wishes claims. That he has to be the one to tell me that still sends my blood boiling. I would have preferred someone more agreeable, less of an arse. It's hard to tr it's a hard truth to swallow, especially when the very person at the center of it makes the denial difficult can't even spare me a minute of his attention, or a single glance at me the whole evening. Hell, Zachary might have spoken more words to me. The big guy's busy covering the event to boot, but at least he manages to slip in a conversation or two between takes, or a small wave of his hand in the cabin. Honestly, Rebecca, that should be a clue that Ashley doesn't think about you the way that you think about him. Like, just, just like let it go already. What's Ashton's excuse? He's been flitting in and out of sight this whole time. One moment he's hanging around a small group, in another he's hovering around a st the string band. Just a second ago, he's wolfing down some deviled eggs by the buffet table, in a glass of wine with a glass of wine in it. The next thing I know, he's gone. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he doesn't want to be with any of his friends. Is it because his boss is here? What's the big deal about that? It has never bothered him before. I swear, the next person who asks, I'm dancing the night away with. Ashton can go fuck himself. You would catch his eye a lot better if you wore nicer clothes, don't you think? Her voice almost makes me jump, too focused on the gob shit wandering around the ballroom in my own annoyance to notice. If she's heard any of the profanities I've mumbled, or she's taken notice of my discomfort, Mere, uh, she makes no comment on it, merely greeting me with a smile when I turn my attention to her. Miss Wright gives off a whole different air when she's not speaking to an audience. Homely, a bit too friendly for my liking. But I guess that comes from being raised in such an environment and having to deal with pompous people. Though I suppose nothing has really changed from years ago. 
I remember her carrying herself in the same manner during that one and only visit. Does she remember any of it? I won't be surprised if she doesn't. It has taken me a while myself. She's probably met a lot of people like little Becky throughout the years. Might have already forgotten about me or my parents. People like her thrive on connections after all. Nevertheless, I return her smile, awkward and stiff as a baby. Didn't realize the housewarming was going to be this uh, fancy. I would have gone with a nice dress if I knew. Oh, you're fine, dearie. It's only really the parvenu, those who climb, that come to these parties all dolled up. Quite the black-haired beauty, isn't he? It takes me a while to realize who she's talking about. Until Ashton walks by again, in closer proximity than any of the times he's done so far. Still, without a look of acknowledgement our way, though, even as Miss Wright speaks loud enough to catch the attention of anyone in the shop. Who, Ash? You know, you really shouldn't have turned down his offers. If I wasn't married, I'd happily go dancing with those young men. But you said a name. Ash, that's the exquisite lad you've been looking at all this time. I don't know him, and I'm the one hosting this party. That must mean you know each other. Is he your boyfriend, then? Because that would explain those rejections. This isn't the first time someone has made that assumption. Almost every student I've had in, in the past did. My coworkers, more often than not, assume he is. A few of my neighbors also think we're an item. Not that Ashton has ever reacted to those. He's been quite indifferent about it, in fact. But his reason clears me now. Still, the heat of a blush creeps up my cheeks, and a denial, and a denial ready, despite wanting it to happen so badly myself. What? N no, that's ridiculous. He isn't my boyfriend. Such a violent reaction. A simple no would have sufficed. Many here would be happy to hear it. And I haven't been looking at him. I do my best to summon a straight face, but before her good cheer, it easily falters. That's right. You've been staring. Quite heatedly, in fact. Although, I'm not sure if you look like you want to kiss him or kill him. It's more the latter, currently. Just don't go murdering him on my property. I don't want to walk into a room and suddenly find a body there. It's infectious, in a way. No sooner I find myself enjoying our chat, more than I've imagined myself to. Although her attention briefly wavers at one point, she remains a good companion. Even more once I've mentioned who my parents are, her face quickly lights up and the fondness graces her face, despite the meeting from several years ago being a short one. But of course, there are some things we really can't avoid talking about. After all, it's one of the few things I remember from asking me the moment she spotted me today. Do you have a boyfriend? In retrospect, it's an odd thing to ask. It's an odd thing to talk about as children, when there are loads we could have started with. Yes, oh, I remember you! You were the cutest little thing with glasses! And when we met, you were having boy troubles with this lad called something with an A. I believe I still have the clothes she gave me. Chosen all so I could impress him. And even back then, Ashton always has been denser than a rock. And that one attempt to get him unnoticed backfired spectacularly. Sure, he's keen. He's a detective, I would say. But feelings, more often than not, escape. It's not entirely useless about it, I know. 
won't be har harboring infections for someone else if he is. Only those that aren't of his own escape him. What was it again? Aaron, Alan, Adele, Albert, Alexander, Andrew? Which makes this whole talk all the more embarrassing. And the more names she lists off, the more my discomfort grows until my smile turns into a grin. What will she think of me? Here she is, married to a man she probably loves as that. Well, I'm stuck in the same place, yearning for the same person. Ashton! Ash! That man is that boy! The same one. Oh, goodness me, after all these years! I can see why, though. He's quite dashing. Y you don't really need to announce it to everyone with an earshot, you know? Keep it down! I'm so sorry, but it really is cute! She says that before a sh short moment, a hint of pity flickers in her eyes. I take that as a chance to change the subject before anything more can be said. I haven't even figured out how I should feel about the things you've told Now I'm getting dragged into a similar discussion. Uh, so, uh, this is a nice party, Miss Wright. Though to be frank, I doubt she will be so willing to pass this up. The topic has already taught her attention. Please, honor is fine. We're friends of a sort, aren't we? We must be friends, seeing as I know about your little infatuation, Becky. Don't you worry, dearie. You'll have your happy ending yet. I'm not too concerned about that, am I? Uh, that's not what I'm looking for. Oh? And what makes you think that? Doesn't everybody want their happy ending? The idea of happy endings sounds like they're just for fairy tales. And they are, sorta. I don't think you can just sit around, trapped in some tower, and hope for the best. If you love them, you have to fight for it, right? You're not just going to sit there and hope that everything will just fix itself on its own. Like everything, you have to work at it. Hypocrisy, that's what this is. How dare I preach about something when it's exactly what I've been doing. I wonder I lost him to someone else, long before my own feelings were known. And then, and then, I go and act as if I'm entitled to any of it. That by virtue of us growing up together, he must return whatever I feel for him. That he's not allowed to look at another, because I'm the one who stayed by his side with all this. When in the first place, Ashton has always been a solid person. This is something I cannot force on you. I can only hold on to these, take care of it, until the time comes I can confess it to you. Great if you reciprocate, but if you can't, if you won't. Selfish. I've been too selfish. How laughable that this word feels right to you. But what do I know? I'm sure the daughter of the two greatest professors I've ever known is smart enough to know what she's talking about. At one point, maybe I would have easily agreed to that. However, the past weeks have also sent changes in the 
has a nice reasoning sound. It turns out whatever I previously It is so brief and almost funny how things I might have said when it before now have thousands of But there will be time to mull about these later, because when a hush suddenly descends the room, a whole different issue rears. Especially when Luke, fucking Luke, strides into the now quiet ballroom, fashionably late, and oozing with the same pompous mien he always carries around with him. Good evening, ladies and gents. Enjoying the party? I hope I'm not too late in welcoming you all to the right mansion. Before long, Hannah leaves my side to join him, and it doesn't take a genius to piece it all together. Welcome, one and all, to our humble abode. Tonight, if you have yet to find yourself in your roles, you are our ladies and lords of the court of your king and queen. If you would excuse my presumptuousness. <laughs> so, enjoy the feast that has been laid out for your senses as we only allowed the best to be served. Enjoy the rest of your night, everyone! His attitude, the manner he carries himself around people, his unfamiliarity with that part of the city, is a fucking horse. I should have known. Although, I'm hardly at fault here, the tabloids and the gossip columns have never been really my thing. I should have also expected that wherever this fucking ride is, some sort of drama will surely follow. He seems the kind of person who revels in it. Figures it'll find him on his own, even when he's not asking for it. It happens amidst a round of applause and boots that people lagging behind the crowd they've gathered does not catch on, until the cheers turn into several scandalous gaps. I am pregnant with your little bastard! You promised me you'll take responsibility! God damn it, Luke! I finally got you to talk to me after months of silence, and you do this to me! What do you mean you're pregnant with? Luke, is this true? Lies and slander, woman! Security! Johans, take her out of here before she makes an even bigger fool of herself! No, no, you do not do this to me! I was so ready to leave my stupid oaf of a husband. I told you to leave that damn wife of yours. Look at her. Does she look like she wants a baby? Does she look like she could take care of a baby? The commotion doesn't go further despite the drunk woman appearing like she has plenty more venom to spill. In a little while, security shows up, escorting her out. Apparently, she's the chief inspector's wife, too. If this whole thing can't get any more fucked up than it already has. What a mess. But the damage has been done. And beyond the repercussions this will bring, I'm more worried about Hannah. Maybe Luke, too, in part. I've seen the man that hides behind his self-importance. And it is someone who cares for the person who stands beside him. No matter how questionable that is now, though sometimes mere affections aren't enough. And I've had enough of you! So guess what? Fuck you, Luke! We agreed to never talk of this woman! Did we? I don't remember. I don't know how long this has been going on. I don't know either of them well enough to judge for myself. I'm simply an outsider who happens to have some kind of connection with both of them. Face it, Lucille Mitchell Wright. You owe me everything. I owe you everything. I owe you... I owe you everything? <gasps> Who's running the business now while you sit at home like a pretty princess? If I recall... 
You told me to retire so that I can enjoy my time as Mrs. Luke Wright. I wouldn't even bother with other women if you were still Hannah Evans! You used to be your own woman! You used to be someone who I could fucking look up to! Now look at you! If I wanted some brainless bint, I'd go to the whorehouse and play any old strumpet like a fucking fiddle. That's all you are now. A brainless, good for nothing. But the second Hannah raises her hand, I put far too late to save an already crumbling relationship. Long before her palm connects with the city. The sound of it echoes throughout the whole ballroom, loud enough to silence everyone. The quiet does not persist, however, and in an instant, Luke orders every guest out. That's it! This party is over! Everybody leave before I have you all thrown out! They're shuffling, a minute of reluctance from every head in the room. But in the end, his anger forces everyone to comply. Shatter explodes throughout the whole foyer once the door has been promptly shut. Worried murmurs, clicks, clicking of tongues, and inappropriate gossip filters through the thick tension. I couldn't care less about any of it. Besides, it's pretty obvious what the topic is. Most of them haven't even left the premises, and they're already talking about it. Tomorrow, it'll be on the news for sure. Every local broadsheet will tabloid Simply thinking about it already gives me a headache. When the shock has faded, I just feel bone tired. I've accomplished nothing of what I come here for, and Ashton's nowhere to be found. I'm not sure what pisses me off more. That he ignored me the whole evening and might have just left without saying anything, or knowing he obviously have some more other motive for being Can't he at least trust his own friends for that? He didn't have to hide it from me. The only relief to be had in this, perhaps, is Zachary's comforting smile when he approaches. He appears as disturbed when he stands beside me, fiddling with the bus buttons on his camera even though the device is off. The eventful night, huh? <laughs> you can say that again. It was awful. He pauses for a moment and stares at me intently. <laughs> then he laughs, a tired one, but filled with humor in spite of what we've witnessed. <laughs> Let me guess, Ashton. Oh, what makes you think he's my problem? It's just a guess. Since all he seems to do lately is piss you off, so I figure, yeah. And, uh, it's all in your face, actually. Ugh, why does he have to? I don't understand that man anymore. Like I always say, you should just... Oh, you can bet your ass we're going to have a very long talk. I'm not letting him off easy this time. I'm 
sure he has a good reason. He won't say it, but he likes being around us. Heck, we're probably the only people he likes. He ain't gonna ruin that for something stupid. He can be dense, but he ain't dumb. But that's exactly what I've been telling people, isn't it? We'll see about that. Let's just go. Are you done here? Yeah, no you stay in when. Just then, the door to the ballroom slams open, and a very irate Luke marches out to the foyer. By now, most of the guests have trickled out of the mansion, leaving only a few loitering around the room. With his fury still at its peak boiling point, it's only natural he'll zero in on the tallest person within his temper's glass radius. Although he's not really making an effort not to let the remaining people in the hall hear his tirade. Well, well, still here, I see. Having a grand time, aren't we? Every bloody goss in this fucking city has something to talk about tomorrow. Great news day, isn't it? I wonder what the headlines will be. Cheating husband lashes out at poor wife. I, I ain't a part of the media, sir. Miss Wright only hired me for the photos, nothing more. Oh, the photos, of fucking course, how could I forget? Darling wifey needs a bloody souvenir, doesn't she? Something to remind her of how she humiliated her asshole of a husband. I'm sure it ain't like that, sir. Hannah's... no one expected... Hand it over. I I'm sorry, what? Are you also deaf? Do I always have to spell everything out to you peasants? Hand the blasted thing over! All of you! If I see one picture, even a single shot of a fucking spoon tomorrow, you will all lose more than your jobs! Now give me the bloody camera! I... I can't do that, sir. I, I do freelance work, and this is my... Do I look like I give a shite? Give it to me, or... I wonder what Kylie will say if she sees Tio Luke right now. For a short second, he looks surprised to find me there. To be honest, I didn't realize I've spoken, either until he turns a livid glare on me. A lesser person will probably cower under it. I will too, perhaps, in another situation where he isn't throwing insults at my friend. That one I simply can't let go of. Oh, Daisy, oh, Daisy. Do you always have to button on other people's discussions. I wouldn't have to if there was actually one happening right now. It's pretty one-sided, eh? A bit offensive, too, if you ask me. Woman, why don't you just bugger off? No one cares what your opinion is, especially in my home. You don't have to worry about that, Mr. Luke Wright. I don't have any plans of staying longer. I'm only here to fetch my friend. I wasn't expecting to see an asshole standing beside him, though. Oh my god, Mayumi, you arrived! What? I'm so excited to see. Uh, but yes, we all agree that Luke has to die. But that won't happen till the very end, so you're just gonna have to wait. Sorry. Rebecca, you really don't have to. Oh, no, no, you shut your trap. Let us say what she wants. I'd love to hear it. That feisty attitude is going to take you places, Daisy. Fair warning, though, woman, and I've said this plenty of times. There's a pause as he steps closer, staring me down with almost little to no effort. I do my best to hold it, but I won't deny flinching at the tone he takes once he lets loose the next words from his mouth. Threats do not work on me. Then and there I believe him, that this man is capable of doing so much more than what any intimidating remark can lob. So if you don't have anything worth my while to say, it'd be in your best interests. If you remove you and your precious friend from my property, Damn, I don't think I've ever heard uh, a host his hostile voice before. 
Now, before I get the security to drag you out. Another person takes that decision out of my hands. Come on, Becca. He ain't worth your time. Without wasting time, Zachary pulls me away from him. By the time I've regained my sentence, or my senses, he's already tugging me by my wrist towards the wide open doors. The stubborn part in me, however, the far who has seen the kind of person he is when he's with Kylie, refuses to withdraw without flinging in a last retort. And here I thought you were a halfway decent guy. Whatever happened to the person his god daughter looks up to? He was never there, Daisy. That man died a long time ago. You're better off not looking for him. I won't. I have no intention to, but I can't resist the urge to glance back before I leave. If only to have one last look at the man he really is. Perhaps I should be thankful this brief acquaintance isn't going anywhere. But the instant I turn my gaze on him, I see it. Oh, what the hell is this? Ugh! No, why is she there? She's so creepy, I hate it. Ah, looming, hovering over his shoulder, drawn to him like a moth to the flame. Like the first time I've stepped inside the place in search of Isabella. He was there too, wasn't he? That man along with his wife and another person, Miss McCullough? And that shadow. No. A woman now. Her no longer a dark blur. Uh, blur. Terror rushes through every vein in my body. Yeah, her, I hate her. It goes with the creepy smile. It just, it's so offensive. A crippling sensation gripping every part of me while she stares at me with a glare filled with nothing but hate and sound. It's like staring at the eyes of a woman I've unknowingly robbed of something precious. I try to say something. A warning. But Zachary's already leading me out of the foyer, oblivious. And before I can gather my wits and voice it out, someone shuts the door behind us. As if to keep outsiders away from the secrets this mansion possesses. Honestly, I can't tell if that ghost is uh, the blonde woman or if it's the black haired woman. Because the hair style was very similar to the blonde lady. Uh, the brush of fresh air against my cheek does little to dampen the chill in my bones. By now the sensation, the fear and disquiet it leaves whenever I see her is, a fami is familiar enough for me. Already it has made a home in my nerves. I don't even notice my trembling hands until Zachary points it out to me. Rebecca? You okay? You ain't looking too good. You're shaking. Hastily, I retract my hands from his hold, crossing my arms across my chest instead in some lame attempt to keep the smallest of movements down. Hang on, folks. I will be right back. Let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. Be right back. I gotta go to the bathroom.
Okay, I'm back. Um, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hastily, I retract my hands from his hold, crossing my arms across my chest in some lame attempt to keep from the smallest of movements down. The cold from the tips of my fingers seeps through the thick material of my shirt regardless. Neither of it helps bring together some semblance of coherent thought in my head. Don't worry about it. I'm good, I... Zachary, did you see anything back there? Oh, about what happened in the ballroom? Or... No, not that. In the foyer, right behind... Never mind. You go ahead of me. Someone has to warn him. I'll just catch a cab on my own. Warn him of what? Wait, Rebecca, did you forget something in there? I, I can... I turn away and walk before he can stop me with a word of protest. It's not wise. Coming back, that is, especially after what happened. But Hannah's still an old friend, and Luke... Luke's neither a friend nor or an enemy. Just an acquaintance who doesn't deserve whatever misfortune that letter might bring. I can't just leave those two in there. Isabella's right. She's real, and there's something she wants from everyone who has read that. What took you so long? Let's go. I'll get the both of you back to the city. My mistake. The second his voice cuts through the crisp air night is that I've allowed my annoyance to get the better of me. Fuming with what my purpose forgotten, I whirl around and march towards him. One accusation after another piles up at the tip of my tongue, ready to be hurled at any moment. There's no hesitation holding me back when I fling it at him. The straight face he keeps as I do so doesn't help my t temper my anger either. It only makes him want to slap some more sense into him. <coughs> Shouldn't we be the one asking you that? Becca, I've been waiting here the whole time. I told you I hate parties like... And before that, where have you been the entire evening? Right then and there, I might have forgiven him if he'd shown some ounce of remorse for leaving me like that. Maybe he could have looked away, given me a sign that my assumptions might be right. He doesn't even need to put them into words. A single gesture of confirmation is all I need. Rather, what I get is the same impassive look. He does that whenever he can't disclose anything. He does that whenever he's lying. In the face of it, amidst the thick tension. A frustrated huff is the only thing I can summon. Be that way. Fine. Suit yourself. But don't you dare think this will be the end of this. We'll talk about this tomorrow, and you better have a proper answer for me by then. No more words. After everything I've seen and heard tonight, I'm already too exhausted for those. So, without speaking any further, I simply stomp over his car and climb inside, slamming the door behind me with as much force my anger can show. They both follow after, and shortly we're on our way back to the city. Yet even with the city's bright lights welcoming us, the dense, somber air from the mansion still lingers. The moon is almost at its highest by the time we reach Salem Wall. Zachary has asked to be drop off first, moment we've entered downtown Luxembourg. Though he never mentions anything and has only words of thanks for us, he probably doesn't want to get caught in another spat between Ashton and I. It's all too clear in his face. The poor man, I'll have to apologize for subjecting him to that some other time. I think he's also hoping we'd be able to fix this without him Oh, how wrong he is. Even after our respective heads have cooled off, the atmosphere within the car remains rife with unspoken tension. This isn't a problem so easily fixed with a few handshakes. Quite frankly, I don't know what will. Ashton himself has no idea what to do when he alights and dawdles awkwardly in the middle of the car park, unsure. It almost seems like he's having an internal debate, whether he should say goodbye or mutter another apology. 
I could have driven him away purely out of spite the second I've gotten off. Still, old habits die hard. It's late, and Ashton's flat is on the other side of the city. Irritation might still rear its head every time I look at him right now. But I'm not too cruel to put him up on another long drive. Especially when he still appears as if he hasn't gotten any rest. You can borrow the couch. I throw the keys to my flat his way before protest from his lips forms. Although he catches it with ease, he eyes it with a wary expression and shoots a puzzled glance my way. You haven't been forgiven. We're still going to have that talk, believe me. But I'm not about to send you out on another drive looking like that. It's late. Go get some rest. We're setting aside a lot of loose ends like this. But he appears to have accepted that reason, at least in the meantime. He does give me another questioning glance when I shove past him, pulling my mobile in the process. Where are you going? I thought... You go ahead upstairs. I need to contact Professor Andrew. Andrew? Why would you... Oh, no. Please. This again? It's been a week, Becca. I thought we already agreed that was a dumb Halloween prank. No need to bring in the old guy. Of course he's still skeptical. It makes me, it makes one wonder if he's seeing anything at all. Figures this curse will stay away from the scoffer. But this is another loose end tonight that I just can't leave alone. Ashton's belief notwithstanding. It just so happens that it's one I can delve into using means other than taking a look at the mansion itself. Ashton, do you really think I still give a shite after that stunt you pulled tonight? No. But this is... I've spent so many years with him to know this is about to turn into another argument. Before he can finish it, I cut him off with a firm raise of my hand. Look, I don't care. There are weird things happening around here. And yes, it's Isabella's brand of weird. Ghostly voices, strange sounds, and a bloody woman sitting at the back of my car. You don't have to believe me. And I no longer have the patience to convince you, so just, just, leave me be, Ashton. He doesn't push it, growing quiet instead, although I know he has a whole case of it prepared inside his head. But there's a reluctant shift in his movement when he steps away from our conversation. Short of climbing the stairs, he stops and turns to face me with an expression almost too... conflicted? Are you really sure? What? That there was something? That you've been, uh, seeing things? Yes. I'm very, very certain. Now go! And you better not break anything in there. The last time I let you stay over, it was that statuette Bell gave me. You haven't even replaced that one. The last one of my reprimand goes both unheard and unanswered as he disappears behind the stairs. If things aren't as strained, he might have a quip or two about that, followed by a light banter. Instead, for a long moment, I am left staring after him. There's something in the way he asks it that nags, coupled with his expression and the whole exchange just feels unsettling. One that doesn't even, or that doesn't fade even as I gather my thoughts and shift my focus on another, even as I dial Professor Andrew's number. And that is when it clicks. During the long wait for the professor, one stray thought emerges from the unease. Ashton has not intended for his question to be a jive. It's concerned. For what?
what the... For my well-being? The letter's curse? The woman I mentioned? The answers for those will have to wait, however. Finally, the call connects and Professor Andrew's voice echoes from the receiver. Uh, Professor Andrew? Sorry, but uh, this is a bit urgent. After all, this is a more pressing matter. Our lives might be at stake, and we're still in the dark. Actually, I was wondering if I could ask you to do me a favor. Professor Andrew Clark has agreed to meet with me two days later in front of Luxburn's public library. He has other commitments, but being a longtime family friend has his perks. I have my parents' connections to thank for that. Of course, I'm not the sort to impose on him. The situation is... Well, it's not entirely bad, although it does require calling in a few favors from friends like him. Without his signature, I won't be able to gain access to the library's restricted section. If I want to get more in-depth information on Ermengarde Mansion, that is. Not simply what they choose to show to the general public. As much as I hate to admit it, there's always something people censor, and whatever it is, I won't ever find it in the general section. thought of that alone makes me antsy. Thankfully, I don't have to brood over it. The wait for the professor doesn't last long. He never did enjoy making people wait, likewise. He dislikes people who are turdy. He arrives five minutes after I do, greeting me with that kind of smile and casual wave of his hand. I haven't seen him in, a lo in so long, but it appears he hasn't changed much. His familiar presence alone is enough for a fond smile to spread across the face. Professor Andrew! Rebecca, didn't I say long ago you could drop the professor? You know I can't possibly do that. Even if I can, it feels disrespectful to call you by your name alone. Both you and Ashton never listen to this old man. Kids these days. All right. But, just for today, since you're doing me a huge favor, Andrew. <laughs> I guess you simply can't have it all, even at this old age. But, pleasantries aren't what we're here for, yes? You mentioned you needed a permit. I... yes, sir, if that's okay with you. More than fine. Anything in pursuit of knowledge, as they say. further prompting. Uh, and just like he promised, he's also written a recommendation after his signature. This is more than enough to get me to those files. I mutter a small thanks before slipping it into my pocket. Although when I look back up, 
his brows are furrowed, the very face of curiosity. Not surprising considering how vague I've been during our little talk over the phone. Right then and there, I've decided to tell him if he ever asks. Maybe not all of it, but stuff he needs to know. It's the least I can do to thank him. As expected, true to his inquisitive nature, he asks. If you don't mind, though, I know you've always been an eager learner, but may I know what in the restricted section that piqued your curiosity? Uh, it's the Amengard Mansion, sir. He's quick to raise an eyebrow at that, and for a while I fear he'll take a sip of of a slip of paper back. Is there something in what I said? The ones they have out in the general isn't enough? I'm, uh, hoping for a more in-depth read, sir. More about the history and the people who once lived there. The general section doesn't have anything much on that. Oh, I see. Well, you certainly aren't the first one to be enamored with that place. It doesn't shock me. The architecture is admirable. And the urban ha. legends are something to talk about. Yeah, there we go, my Yumi's. Gotta get some of that ghost porn. Why, just this past week. I've got a few asking me about that. <laughs> Imagine that. I think enamored might be a little too much to describe our interest in it. We're finally getting close to the end of Rebecca's route. She's gonna die in the library. But I have to agree. The mansion is beautiful, even with the renovations. They kept the stained glass windows, too. They are magnificent. Spoilers for anybody watching for the first time. Oh, you've seen it. Actually, I don't know if she dies. I just know that we get the bad ending in the library. I was there for a few hours to attend a housewarming party. The invitation was for my parents, but they couldn't make it. My mom used to work as a private tutor for the Evans. Hannah Wright? Oh, sorry, Mayumi. I turned off the stickers, so uh, you're not going to be able to see them. Ah, I know of her. Her husband, too. Who doesn't? Luxborn's most popular couple. Something falls behind his eyes. The warmth in them suddenly gone, like he's reliving a painful distant memory and seeing it play out right now. It disappears almost as soon as the surfers, but that look has unsettled something. Is something the matter? Uh, nothing much. But you know, you're already like a daughter to me. So if you could, do be careful with the friends you make. Is this about the right, sir? <laughs> Just a friendly advice from an old man. Don't think much about it. Anyway, I have to leave now. Can't miss my weekly serving of bear claws. Say hi to your parents at the detective inspector for me, will you? I wish you luck with all that research. I will. Thanks for this, Andrew. Andrew gives my shoulder a light squeeze, the gesture a younger man has always appreciated, and quickly crosses the street after. I watch him until he disappears behind the door to a cafe, until the doubt swimming inside my head finds a moment to rest. Whatever his business is with the rights isn't anything I should concern myself about. But somehow, in the grand scheme of things now, all of it feels oddly relevant. The how, though, I've yet to find out. And I'm hoping the library will give me the answers I want this time. On a gloomy Sunday morning, the library is especially empty. The second floor in particular. I've always considered this place to be a sanctuary, in a respite away from the hubbub of the city. As a child, I grew up reading books here, spending hours here to no end, poring over the pages, living out the fantasies in my head until my parents called me home. Now it feels like nothing. Now it feels nothing like it. The silence is smothering suffocating even with how clean they've kept the micro i'm not sure how to pronounce that how the entire smell small of it lacks a speck of dust or clutter breathing is a struggle for air 
Not far into my stay, I begin to long for the noise outside, and perhaps as a way to calm this unease, I start to hum a tune. Imagine that. <laughs> Why of all things, it has to be that silly nursery rhyme. I've not an inkling. It does its job, however. It fills the lull with something far less awkward, far less deafening, and that is enough for a distraction. I have business here. No time for silly daydreams. Only important work to attend to. Even if there's a possibility of it being fruitless by some means, it feels like I have to do it. If not for me, then for the people who have been affected by this. This. What do we even call it? A haunting? A Halloween prank gone wrong? A curse? If Isabella were here, what would she say? Would she panic? Will she be angry I only listen to her now? It all stems from that one moment in the movie house, doesn't it? We could have avoided this had we only taken her warnings to heart. One stupid mistake is all it took to send our normal lives down a downward spiral. Frankly, I'm no longer sure if I'm angry at myself for it, or at the universe for throwing us into this mess. But we can only make do of what little we have, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Going here might not be the right decision, but it's a start. A good start. It doesn't take much time for me to find what I need. A microfiche of old newspapers, long kept in special storage cabinets at the far end of the restricted section. The year is 1620s and beyond. Before the city of Luxborn even exists in the records, when the mansion had just been built, and Anselm is nothing more but a small, sleepy hamlet near a river. A lot of pieces are missing. Days, sometimes several consecutive weeks without any records. Often it goes on for years. Troublesome as it is, I'm lucky enough to find anything at all considering how far I'm looking back. Can't be picky now. Can't waste time mulling over what record keepers of the old could have done to make this a breeze for me. I can still work with this. The faint whir of the microfiche machine keeps me company as I go over each slide, each image, hoping for something that goes beyond what the local lore knows. There are snippets, little mentions of the family that once settled in the house here and there. Alright, I have to run to the restroom again because all the tension is, is making me nervous. Sorry about that. The usual singing of praises for the couple who helped brought up what was once a tiny settlement to a bustling town. Nothing substantial. Nothing I didn't know before. It continues on like this for a good while. Until I come by the years after their deaths. People of Anselm might have loved Lord William and Lady Elizabeth Ermengarde, mourned their passing, and held them in high esteem in the years after. But it was their daughter that was remembered fondly by the townspeople. If her parents built this town, Lady Charlotte was the one who made it prosper. Remarkable, considering it was a period of recovery from a bout of plague that killed half the town's population, including her parents. What's surprising, though, apparently her time also marked 
more than superficial changes to the place. She moved things, changed laws, altered old customs and traditions. If they were done on a woman's whimsy, it doesn't say. But she seems capable enough for more than that. Oh shit, here's Lady Charlotte burning her maid at the stake, y'all. The gist of it, the town she rebuilt? It's what eventually grew to become Luxborn City, while the nearby Anselm village remained as it was, a relic of the old. A frown swiftly forms in my face. So, why is there a need to hide this? One by one, I try to recall every lesson I've gone through, every book, paper, and journal I've read. None of those ever mentioned this. It's always the lord and the lady of the house, their endearing child, always an afterthought to those anecdotes, the one who always took her life in the end, never someone who restored a town from the brink of collapse or brought new ideas to it. Is it because she's a woman? <sighs> that pisses me off. Granted, not everything is sunshine and rainbows. Not all aspects of her can be considered admirable. But this is history. Some parts of it are bound to naturally delve into unpleasant territory, whether I like it or not. Witch hunts, for example, became common near the end of her life. Which would have completely unremarkable, and might have gone to become a mere footnote in history if it didn't involve Lady Charlotte and the very slaves she saved. It cost quite a stir, enough to leave almost a week's worth of clippings. The girl was eventually burned and condemned by an entire town, at the word of Lady Charlotte alone. But this doesn't really have anything to do with the curse, does it? Unless that woman, following us, and the slave are the same person. A tale of revenge? How cliché. However, with the lack of accurate photographs, it's impossible to tell Maybe if I squint, the illustrations would start resembling her. But in my field, it doesn't work that way. It shouldn't work that way. I'll be the laughing stock of the community. Uh, this isn't going anywhere. Mentally exhausted, I take a careful step away from the screen, pressing a palm to my tired eyes. The lack of ample light in this area doesn't help. A headache already threatens to form at the back of my head yet I'm nowhere near figuring things out. This is simply too much to take in all at once. I should have asked for someone's help. Now I'm at a dead end. I start gathering everything around me and placing them back in their respective envelopes for storage. The motion's no longer new after volunteering here a number of times. I didn't make much mess anyway, considering the lack of materials. Available to begin with. I'll have to look somewhere else. The where remains unknown, though. But just as I'm about to slip the last of the slides in, something catches my attention. My hand pauses. The, micro the microfiche halfway through its protective sleeve. This is one of the few I've set aside without taking a careful look at it. It seems like a gossip column at first, but upon closer look... I slide it back to the reader, gently turning its dial in search of the page. It takes some time, but once the image becomes clear, they must have had this drawing commissioned for this announcement. I don't doubt it. The details are far more intricate, their likeness likely closer to how they might have appeared at the time. They're both recognizable this way, closer to those paintings I've seen in the mansion. However, it's the man standing beside her, Edward Garf Godfried, according to the article, that caught my attention previously. Her first cousin, and eventually her fiancé. Maybe it's the posture, the manner in which he holds himself, or maybe it's the shape of his eyes, though I can't be too certain about that until I've gotten a better reference. Nevertheless, there is a resemblance. 
He looks eerily like. My head snaps up, glowering at whoever's running in the floor above. Any day I'd march upstairs and reprimand whoever it is. This is a library, for heaven's sake! But now isn't the time. I've gotten what I need. Without wasting another minute, I hit the machine's print button for a copy of the page, while my other hand moves to put everything back in storage. A ragged exhale comes from me. Relief, perhaps? Or maybe this is exhaustion. Regardless, soon I'm closing my eyes as I wait for the printer to finish, if only to stab off a headache building from everything. Sometime I've even begun humming the same song again for comfort. Despite my doubts about this, despite all the tension in my shoulders, this may be a small find, but at least I can start somewhere. We can start somewhere. There's a way out of this. I know it. The printer sputters to a halt. However, its sound isn't what makes me snap open my eyes. Oh, God. A feeling, a chilly brush of air behind my back. Brief enough for something sickening to suddenly lodge itself in my throat while I take in my surroundings. It's that suffocating sensation again creeping to every part of me, crawling under my skin, draining me little by little of any strength. From that day in the mansion, from that brief moment at the school, without delay, I grab the paper and make a quick beeline for the door. Oh my god! Ugh! I always forget... I always forget this part. Just... No, no matter how often I see this, she still is so disturbing that I just can't handle it. What are you doing, Miss Pink? I hold my breath, not daring to make any noise. For a little while, the only sound of papers crumbling under my grasp is the room. The excitement from earlier gone. Replaced by a cold, steaming thread spreading from it. But more than fear is the anger. It pains me to hear her using my own student's voice against me. The more and more than once I believe. Despite my heart threatening to burst out of my chest, but in this maze of 
bookshelf and the whole place almost void of people. Is there ever a safe, safe enough place I can escape to? Okay, I think for the bad people, I'm supposed to, uh, For the bad ending, we're supposed to, uh... So here we go. There are people upstairs, aren't there? The weekend staff or some volunteer? There should be. Even if it's a Sunday and I'm only here on a special permit, there should at least be one other person manning this late. I heard them a while ago. Of course, I could possibly tell them about this. They won't believe me in the same manner we didn't buy Isabella's stories until it's too late. Now, what's important is that I don't end up trapped in the world with her. Safety in numbers, as they say. There's no hesitation in my steps as I race up the stairs, ears straining for any sight or sounds of the woman appearing and jumping at me again any second. I can still hear her behind me, the grinding of bones, her whispers as she keeps calling me back. Although it's at a distance, I don't slow my pace. Library fools be damned, because no matter how much I pretend to be brave, the level-headed one or the tough one, this terrifies me. This scares me more than anything. This isn't, this isn't how I plan to die. But when I get to the third floor, <laughs> only silence welcomes me in an emptiness that stretches out far too wide, spanning the entirety of the floor for it to be reassuring. Just behind me, somewhere at the foot of the stairs, panic rises up my throat. No other way now but up. So I bolt, desperation kicking in without warning. I take two steps at a time, tripping clumsily over some of it, and my last ditch attempt to escape. In the back of my mind, I know. I know all of this is too tight. Every football, every ragged breath, every pounding of my heart gets hammered into my mind. It only becomes clear to me once the door opens, or once the door at the end opens, revealing the vast expanse of Luxborn's early morning skyline, with her treading at my heels, blocking my only way out. Stay away from me! A useless plea. Does she even understand a word I say? Does she even? Is she still human in the first place? Somehow. I don't think she's human, lady. I think that she is long past, uh, being human anymore. Because no human being will ever do this. Simply imagining what she's capable of doing to us. I never want to give her that chance. I'm telling you to back off! <laughs> Here, even as I pull away to take back the Wake you up? No, I 
I left you a voicemail, so I thought, where are you? The one I grew up with. Who always got grades better than I did without even trying. Whose silly antics I have to put up with all these years. Who stood by me even when things got tougher. The one person who's been a constant in my life. Ash, do you remember that one time? The what? Back in secondary, we joined a contest back then, didn't we? We had to dress you up as a girl and... No. What? You looked really pretty. I think I still have that picture somewhere. Burn it. We're not talking about that again. You promised. Seriously, what brought this on? Nothing. Just... it's just the first thing I remembered. So weird. Despite everything, my lips curl up into a smile. Faint, a sad little thing on its own given the situation. Because even at the very end, I know I have this. The casual talk, the friendly banter, talking like how we always would as children. If only I haven't been too selfish. If only I haven't taken all of this for granted in favor of my feelings. Then perhaps I won't be regretting anything now. You're being weird today, Becca. Whatever. Listen, I need you to go home right away. I'm at Salem Well right now and... I wish time would simply stop for us. There are still a lot of things I want to say. Things I've never bothered saying out loud. Things I should have said a long time ago to someone who's always been by my side. But in this moment, there's only one. Thanks, Ash. Hold on, did I do something? For everything. Rebecca, what? I'm so glad to have known you. Wait, what are you? God damn it, Rebecca, where are you? A soft click, and I'm closing my eyes. There's a rush of air. The sound of the world dimming around me. Like a song coming to its inevitable end. London Bridge is falling uh. down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. <laughs> oh dear. You've unlocked a memory fragment. Oh Jesus. That is some serious shit that I'm seeing. Damn. Alright, well we have reached the end of Rebecca's bad ending. Uh, it looks like Lady Charlotte's torturing or killing her fiancé? And the slave is, or not slave, the one, well, she was her slave, but the lady, yeah, this is, this whole image is just a bunch of disturbing. Oh shit, I didn't even notice the cat! What the hell? Why are you being so mean to the cat? The cat didn't do anything to deserve that. Alright, uh, well, time to end the stream. Uh, Mayumi, if you'd be so kind to join me in Discord. Anyway, have a good night, everyone. Or not a good night. Rest, good rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.